Hello, I'm LA Controller Ron Galprin. As our city's chief financial officer and watchdog, it's my job to manage the city's spending and to make sure that public dollars are being put to good use by keeping our government honest, responsive, and accountable. Because people want to know and deserve to know that our government is doing its best to serve you and to use your money well. It's important for the city to plan how to use its money wisely and make good investments. And it's just as important for each of us as Angelinos to do the same. Because the financial health of our city government depends on the financial health of every Angelino. That is why it's so important that we have programs and workshops for financial planning and financial literacy to help you to succeed and to make positive financial choices about your futures, to plan, to save, to invest, to manage your finances for your future, for your family's future, for our city's future. Thank you so much to our wonderful LA Library and its leadership, including Chief Librarian John Zabo. Thank you to all of the staff and to the volunteers, notably our certified financial planners, and the Library Department of Lifelong Learning and its partners. Thank you for ensuring that everyone has the tools and resources necessary to get on a good track and to stay on a good track financially. To help with this, I would encourage you to check out my How to Build a Financial First Aid Kit Tool, which gives you all of the info you need to be prepared for an emergency. And you can check that out at lacontroller.org forward slash financial first aid kit. I wish you a positive and fruitful experience at this event and thank you all for participating. Hello everyone, I'm Caroline Zakarian and I work in the Office of Civics and Community Services here at the Los Angeles Public Library. Welcome to Financial Planning Week. Today's presentation is brought to you by the Financial Planning Association of Los Angeles and the Los Angeles Public Library. Today, Amy Bourne from the FPA will be talking to you about investing, investment concepts, and how investing fits into an overall plan. So please, uh, we're gonna have a short Q&A after the presentation, so keep your questions coming. Um, and uh, take it away, Amy. Thank you. Great, thanks, Caroline. I'm excited to be here today. Again, my name is Amy Bourne. I'm a certified financial planner and I've been working within the investment management industry for over 25 years. I'm excited here today to talk to you about investment basics. So let's get started. So what we'll cover today is three areas of, uh, of investing. One, we'll explore the investing um, landscape We'll explain how investing fits into your overall financial plan. We'll introduce general investment concepts, and then we'll discuss ways to put these strategies into action. What we're not going to cover today, though, is I'm not going to make you a top stock picker. I'm not going to provide inside information, and I'm not going to re uh, recommend a specific course of action. So. We are going to cover just basic concepts um, so that you can get started on your way to um, building a, a, a solid investment portfolio. So in terms of key concepts, um, what we'll look at is, is, is savings uh, and, and then moving on to in, in investing. Um, and we'll cover all these topics as, as we go into what's, what's going to be covered today. So in terms of savings, uh, savings is uh, a, a key concept that uh, is different than investing. So when you save, you're going to be putting your money into a traditional bank, uh, savings account or money market fund. Um, you're gonna earn regular interest and you'll report that on your tax return, assuming that it's in a taxable account. And then you'll have that money that's immediately accessible and you'll know that, that those assets will be there. So in terms of FDIC insurance, um, if the bank goes bankrupt, you know that, that you're gonna be insured and then you'll get uh, your dollars back. And that's savings. 
Um, so what we don't want to do is use a savings account uh, for investing purposes and investing would be for longer term. So when you invest, you're actually buying an asset with anticipation for it to grow over time. During that time, you can expect a certain amount of fluctuation in that uh, investment, some more than others, and we'll get into that. Uh, but on a daily basis, it doesn't hold that $1 per value. It's, it's going to move on a daily basis. And when you need the cash, you need to, you need or the money for some purpose, you need to convert that into cash. And so that means that you'll need to sell at whatever prevailing market price that you're able to sell it in order to get the cash. And you have to recognize that that because these assets move up and down, you can actually lose money. So if you buy a stock today and it goes down tomorrow when you sell it, you actually can experience a capital loss. So you want to make sure that when you are investing, that you are investing long term and you don't have to sell during uh, market dislocations. So some reasons to save versus invest savings would be for emergencies. And our general recommendation is, as financial planners is that we recommend anywhere between three to six months of living expenses as savings or your emergency fund. So that way you or your significant other loses a job, uh, becomes disabled uh, for a period of time. You have some money that you can tap into that you know that's going to be there. Other reasons to save is for a vacation. Uh, say you wanna go to Mexico next year. You have to figure out how much that Mexican trip will, will cost. And then you figure out how many months you have until that trip. And you break it down every month and try to save for that particular goal so that you're not accessing credit cards um, for discretionary needs. And then other short-term goals um, you know, could be buying a new car or um, if you're a homeowner, getting new carpet for your house. Some reasons to invest is for retirement. I think that would be your number one goal to invest. Um, that, that is gonna be a long-term time horizon depending on how, you, how old you are today. If you're 20 or if you're 70 and haven't retired yet, this is a definitely a goal that you want to make sure it's high on your priority list because there's no financial aid for retirement. So making sure that you put yourself first. And then once you've got retirement set, then another goal might be college. So you might have kids that are five years old or two years old, and you're thinking, wow, it's gonna cost you know, 70,000 today to send this child to USC. Well, I better start saving. Um, or you consider other schools that are cheaper. Uh, but it's it's a it's a, a big nut, um, and today it, it could cost anywhere from a hundred to two hundred thousand to send a kid to a four year school. So that's something to think about when they're young. And then other long term goals um, yeah, could be for buying a, a rental property, um, you know, to generate income when you're retired or. Uh, a boat or something like that. So that that would be uh, a longer term goal. Something that's more than three to five years off is when you actually invest. Anything shorter of that, you, you'll want to save or uh, or select very uh, safe investments when you're looking at uh, sort of shorter term goals. And before we drill in, down into investments, let's talk a little bit about estate planning, I mean, financial planning and what it entails. So financial planning is taking a look at your entire picture today. That's from um, insurance, uh, employee benefits, your investments, your taxes, retirement and estate planning. So those are the very important uh, components of the overall financial planning process. 
So you want to make sure when you look at investments that you're, I mean, in insurance or that you're adequately insured. So if you're a renter, do you have renter's insurance? If you're a homeowner, do you have adequate homeowner's insurance? Um, do you have an umbrella policy? Are you insured enough on your auto policy for liabilities? Um, so making sure that those risks that could be catastrophic are covered. And then employee benefits, that's a great place to go for looking at, um, you know, in terms of insurance, um, 401k, that sort of thing. So you want to go to your, your employer to, to look and see what's available. So before you invest, um, you'll want to take, you want to take a sort of a, a financial uh, inventory of what you're doing today. The first thing you want to make sure you're doing is, is making sure that you have a handle on your cash flow. So that is to make sure that you have an emergency fund um, so that in case your car breaks down, you're not dipping into credit cards to pay uh, for that repair because credit cards can cost anywhere, anywhere from 15% to over 20%. And you're not going to be able to earn that in the market or being invested. So you'll be behind and you'll never get ahead. So you want to make sure that you're paying down your debt, you're uh, building up that emergency fund, and you have your cash flow sort of set. And then um, make sure that your insurance is, is, is in place. And so that would be life insurance. And that's if you're if you have uh, dependents that depend on you for your income, um, that's an important part of it. Um, term insurance is very inexpensive depending on how old you are. And if you're working, that, that would be important. Another insurance would be disability. So if something happens to you and you're temporarily disabled, you're not able to work, it could cover those expenses while you're disabled. Um, and the, the state actually kicks in for short-term disability as well. So there's some state benefits as well. And then the last thing is to write a will. A will is very important um, in terms of making sure that your heirs understand what your intentions are in case you die prematurely. Um, it outlines who will be the guardian to your children if you have minor children as well as how your assets will be distributed. If you don't have a will, it's called dying intestate. So that means that the state has a plan for you. And so if you want to make sure that you have your wishes um, honored, you'll want to have an, uh, a will. And then next, we'll talk a little bit about uh, investing. So the first place to start and where I recommend is with your employer. Typically, uh, many employers and they'll start to be any employer over 50 will start to be required to offer retirement plans under uh, new legislation. But your employer should have a retirement plan eligible for you to participate in. And one benefit is that many offer a match. And so that's free money that you're leaving on the table. So, for example, a lot of plans will offer a 50 percent match on your first, say, six or seven percent of your deferral. So that means you put in seven percent of your income and the company will put in three and a half percent. So that means that you're actually putting in 10 and a half percent of your income. Um, so you're getting an extra boost and a free return on your money. So you don't wanna leave money on the table. If your employer, if you're a smaller employer and they don't offer retirement plans, another option would be an individual retirement account or an IRA. And there's two types of IRAs. There's a traditional IRA, which you deduct when you put money into the account. And then that money grows tax deferred. And once you take it out, you'll be taxed then. So you have a tax deferral. 
And the second is a Roth IRA. So that means you take after tax money, you put it into this Roth IRA, but one benefit is it grows tax free, assuming that you take it out after 59 and a half and five years. So that is particularly uh, attractive for people that are younger because they're in a low tax bracket today. So paying a smaller amount of tax today to get the trade-off for tax-free earnings when they're in a higher tax bracket or in the future that can compound for many, many years, that can be very, very attractive. So generally, if you're in your 30s, um, I recommend definitely going the Roth IRA route if you qualify because uh, there are income limits for it. The third uh, way is for uh, college savings. And one savings uh, plan is called a 529 plan, which is offered by many different states. Uh, California actually has one. Um, you don't have to participate into California's plan, but it is here for you. Other states offer income tax deduction benefits, but California, of course, does not. Um, but it is a, a you know highly rated plan by Morningstar, so that's a great way to start. And you can start as little as $25 a month. And in fact, um, since I have a 16-year-old today, and we started his 529 plan when he was a baby, and I even have my parents contributing on a monthly basis to that. So sometimes it's it's better for your uh, your parents to put in money into this college savings account instead of buying them a toy um, that, you know, will get thrown away in, in a couple of years. So that's a great way to start. And again, it's called a 529 plan. And then the last way is to, after you've maxed out your 401ks and you've set aside enough into college savings accounts, the last way is to invest in taxable accounts. So you can just set up an account in your name or your and your spouse's name as joint tenants, and you can buy stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. And what will happen is that you get taxed on that every year. So if the interest income comes in or dividends from stocks, you'll pay income tax every year on those earnings. And that's a great way to supplement your retirement savings. So in terms of creating an investment plan, the first step is to identify your investment goals and time horizons. So if you're thinking about retiring, you have to sit back and say, okay, when do I wanna retire? Do I wanna retire when I qualify for social security? Or do I wanna retire uh, at 70 when I max out my social security? Um, or do I want to retire early and work part time? So think about what it is that you want to accomplish. And then you'll want to look at different types of investments that balance risk and return. So the higher the risk, the higher the return, technically, and the lower the risk, the lower the return. So if you wanted to be an aggressive investor, then you'll probably have a portfolio that has mostly stocks. If you're very conservative and you worry about when the stock market fluctuates on a day-to-day -day basis, then you'll want to add bonds to help mitigate that risk. Once you've created an investment strategy, say 60% in stocks and 40% in bonds, then you select the investments. So you decide, what types of bonds that I'm going to own in my portfolio and what types of stocks do I want to own? And you, and you want to be obviously diversified. And then once you've implemented that strategy, don't forget about it. So you'll want to monitor and update your portfolio along the way. So if you've implemented a strategy that's 60% of stocks and 40% in bonds, and we have a very good year, um, you know, at, you, even this year, equities are up 20%. So your equities grow to 65% in equities. Well, you want to take that 5% sell it and put it into bonds so you can get back to that investment strategy that you're targeting. 
We'll talk a little bit about risk. We, we alluded to this. Um, the risk return trade-off has a lot to do with your time horizon. So if you have a long time horizon, you have the ability to take on more risk. Um, there's two things with risk. There's the ability and then there's willingness. So just because you have a long time horizon may not mean that you want to take that much risk. So you have to balance the two. One way to understand your risk tolerance is through a risk tolerance um, a questionnaire. And next slide, please. So if you look at online tools, there's a lot of questionnaires out there, there even um, some of the brokerage firms like Schwab or Fidelity will have tools that help you understand your risk profile. So uh, questions like, are you willing to lose some principle in pursuit of higher returns? A yes or no. Um, does your investments keep you up at night? Um, do you check your account on a daily basis? Um, and that's key. That's key. There's studies that have been done that people that check their investment accounts less are happier because they don't see those day-to-day -day fluctuations that can be, can give you somewhat of a heartburn, especially if you think about 2020, when we went into uh, COVID shutdowns, the market went down over 30%. So if you panicked and sold, you would have been out of the market and you wouldn't have participated and everything's pretty much recovered. Um, at least the US equities have recovered um, and you would have lost out on that return. So make sure that you understand at what point will you uh, sell and just say, wave the white flag and say, I'm going to sell and I'm getting out of this. Or are you a type of investor that knows that 78% of the time the stock market goes up. So are you willing to bet against those odds? Uh, and you know that it's going to come back eventually. Okay. So being realistic, uh, recognizing that markets go up and down. Um, remember that if you just put your money into FDIC insured accounts, that that's going to be the return that you get. Today, uh, rates for uh, savings accounts, as you know, is very, very low. Um, the Federal Reserve, uh, they fix what rates are. They tell us what rates are, and they've fixed it at 0 to 0.25%. So as we know, um, we're not earning anything against uh, against our cash. We're pretty much earning zero. And then evaluate what you can reasonably expect from various types of investments. So cash, earning nothing, pretty much will lose against inflation over time. Then there's bonds. If you look at bonds, very low returns today. Um, if you look at the 10-year treasury bond, so if you bond a 10-year treasury bond, it's about one and a half percent, so extremely low. And then there's equities, which have the potential to grow, but of course have much higher downside risk. So you've got to be obviously realistic about what you want to invest in. Let's take a look at performance history. So this chart is... Um, goes back to 1926. So it goes back to really pr pretty much the inception of the US stock market. And it looks at um, the dollar, the growth of a dollar. So you can see um, in stocks, uh, the top line, um, that's the growth of, of a dollar and dollar terms, as well as percentage returns. And then municipal bonds, government bonds, and treasury bills. So if you look at treasury bills, it's actually a negative return. And this is after taxes and inflation. So even though treasury bonds have been positive or treasury bills have been positive over that time frame, once you minus taxes and inflation, you're actually behind. 
So that's probably for a long-term time horizon. Obviously, this is extremely long-term time horizon. You know that you're pretty much not going to make any money in cash or what a, a proxy for cash would be treasury bills. And then government bonds is barely keeping up with inflation and taxes. So you're just barely ahead. And you'll see the line is very smooth. Uh, but again, you're not getting ahead. And then municipal bonds at about 1%. And then stocks, it's the clear winner um, it, in terms of, of, of uh, hedging against long-term effects of inflation. But again, the road it can be very bumpy. And let's take a look at uh, volatility. So what this chart shows is different decades. So 1930s, 40s, et cetera. What that return was, um, what that return was during that decade, and then what the annualized standard deviation was. So, um, so here we, we, let me define what standard deviation is. So standard deviation is just one measure of volatility or risk. So what it says is I can expect generally two thirds of the time for my return to fall into a certain range. So it, the higher the standard deviation, the bigger the range. So if you have a standard deviation of 37, that means if my historical return is 7%, I know two thirds of the time, my return is gonna fall somewhere between 7% minus 37% or 7% plus 37%. So that's a huge range. Um, if you look at bonds, their standard deviation is much, much lower, probably in the more like 8% range. So you're not going to have that kind of fluctuation that stocks have. But it's changed over time. So you can see 2010 to 2019, we've had about a 13.5% return during that time and about a 12% standard deviation. But if you look from 2000 to 2009, a sort of a what we call that lost decade, you actually had a negative return during that period of time. So if you didn't have the ability to wait out those 10 years, you would have actually had a negative return. So, uh, but you more than made it up in the last 10 years. So you wanna make sure that when you invest, you understand the volatility. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, time and diversification. So in terms of volatility, um, this is very similar chart that we saw that, that illustrates what we just talked about in terms of volatility. It looks at range of returns. So if you look at the ver vertical axis, it goes from positive 60 down to negative 50. So in any one year, which is the green, stocks can be up 47% or down 38% in any one year. However, if you extend that time frame to five years, the range of the expected returns go down because you have an additional four years to make up a loss, a really big loss for one year. So when you move to the right, you'll see a five-year return uh, difference of up 28 and down only three. So that's a significant difference between the two. So you want to make sure that when you're investing in stocks, you have a long-term time horizon that you can make up for that difference. And when you roll out to 20 years, you can see stocks have, have not had a negative experience over a 20 year period. And that's typically a long time frame for if you're saving for retirement. So if you're 40 years old and you're saving for retirement when you're 60, 
you you can be rest assured, knock on wood, that that money invested in stocks will make money over that 20 year time frame. And then if you look at the 50 50 portfolio, um, going back to the one year return, you can see the range of the return is much skinnier. So up 33 and down 15. Um, so the way to mitigate that sort of volatility risk is to add bonds to the portfolio. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about asset allocation. Asset allocation is, is a strategy where you diversify amongst different asset classes. So it's not only diversification, meaning that I'm just not holding one stock, I'm holding a 20, 30, 100 stocks for diversification. This is asset allocation. So meaning that I have large company stocks, I have small company stocks, I have international and emerging markets, I have bonds, I have commodities. So different asset classes that behave differently in different market cycles, it actually helps reduce your risk because some assets are up while some assets are down. So let's talk about a sample asset allocation. So this is 65% uh, in uh, stocks. We have 25% in bonds and then 10% in cash. So this is a sample asset all allocation that maybe somebody uh, who is closer to retirement might have. Um, someone in their you know, 60s uh, that will be drawing off that portfolio the bonds, the 25% provide stability. So if they need cash for the upcoming year and equities are down in that particular year, the client can take or sell from the bonds that have held up better. And then in a year that's particularly good for stocks, we can trim back those stocks uh, for that liquidity that's needed during that year. But trying to maintain this allocation over time. The next page shows sort of a sample allocation um, by versus a uh, younger versus older. So you can see the younger investment investors that are aggressively uh, investing toward retirement can have most of their retirement assets in stocks. And then when you get older, again, you'll want, uh, you know, they, that would be an allocation, maybe somebody in their 70s or 80s. Um, that don't have that 10 year time horizon to make up a lost decade, they're gonna have more in bonds. But of course there's always exceptions to the rule. So uh, we talked a little bit about asset allocation and diversification. Uh, here are some examples of uh, what types of investments you'll wanna diversify in. Uh, long and short-term bonds, um, large and company, uh, small company stocks and in international emerging markets. And then consider a combination of individual securities, mutual funds and exchange traded funds. Uh, individual securities, I don't recommend people buying individual stocks. I know a lot of people do it uh, and have made a you know, good amount of money in some of these stocks. Um, but it is, it takes a, a lot of time, a lot of research, um, and there could be business risks that you don't recognize as a shareholder. So always better to uh, buy a pool of assets like a mutual fund or ETF um, it, because it, it will help uh, mitigate the risk if you buy one company and that company has a lawsuit and the stock price goes down. Uh, so that's, I think it's more important to be diversified uh, than, than trying to pick a stock uh, and get it right. And then weigh uh, each new investment for the diversification that it adds. So um, if you're looking at real estate or if you're looking at commodities, making sure that it's an appropriate allocation um, given the volatility. 
So choosing investments, this is the hard work. Uh, so you can do it two ways. You can do it yourself or you can work with a financial professional. If you do it yourself, um, I recommend a, a resource online. It's called Morningstar.com. And um, that provides uh, sort of a third party research uh, group that monitors the tens of thousands of mutual funds out there. So it, it will, uh, you can go for free, uh, you know, go there for free and you can find a lot of analytical data, but I also like to pay the pretty nominal subscription to pull down the analyst report. So if you're looking for, you, you say, I want a, a mutual fund that invests in large company stocks and that's actively managed. So that means that the manager is picking the individual stocks for which you, to invest. Um, you can actually check and see what the rating is uh, and read an analyst report um, about they, they cover everything from performance to process to philosophy and price. Uh, price is very important. So uh, a, a statistic that you should write down is expense ratio. And an expense ratio in and of itself is not that meaningful. But when you compare it to its peers, it is more meaningful. So if you have a large cap stock uh, fund that you're looking at, and it has an expense ratio of 1.5, but that expense ratio for the peer group is half that 0.75 you know it's it's an expensive fund and can you find another fund that has just as good performance but half the cost or you can do a route called passive investing so that means that you just buy an index and that etf or the mutual fund will mimic that index so you know that your investment will just go up and down with the market. So if you wake up the next day and you know the S&P 500 is down uh, 20 points, well, you understand that you're, you're gonna be down uh, 20 points or um, 1% or whatever that is, you know that you're gonna be getting that investment return. And working with a financial pro professional, um, that's if you don't have confidence in doing this yourself or, that you need a coach to make sure that you're not making any unwise decisions. So if you're the type of person left to your own devices and you the market goes down and you panic and you'll sell, um, and it, you know if hiring an investment professional, you'll just have to call that investment professional and they'll be able to talk you um, off that ledge and stay invested, which is really important key to long-term investing success. And um, choose among uh, suitable investments. So what I say is suitable is be careful with um, esoteric investments. So if you don't totally understand the investment process, the universe for which they pick their investments, um, you may want to just pass because sometimes if it is too complicated or it's too good to be true, then um, it probably is. So you want to make sure that you fully understand uh, the investment that you're getting into, understand what market environments that particular fund will do well or not well in, and understand that uh, if you're in a particular mar market environment, for example, um, you're investing in a value oriented investment and value is out of style. Well, you don't want to switch to growth because it's doing better and it did great last year um, because you're, you're basically flipping investments too quickly. So you want to make sure that you hire an investment or buy an investment, understand the philosophy and stick with it for the long term. Um, and make changes as appropriate. Obviously, if there's a manager that leaves um, an investment group, that's a big change. You have to reevaluate that 
that manager. So making sure that you stay on top of it, you monitor, um, and you make changes along the way. Let's talk a little bit about mistakes to avoid. Um, don't don't concentrate on one or two investments. You know, they people will say, "Hey, I'm I'm diversified. I have Facebook, Google, and Amazon. I'm diversified." And no, I would not say that you're diversified. So making sure that you don't concentrate on one or two investments. Don't put money into investments you don't understand. I alluded to that before. And then don't overload on company stocks. And um, this used to happen many, many years ago when they didn't regulate uh, as much as they do today. Uh, but for an example, Enron would um, put all their em employer matches in stock and, and bonuses in stock. So you end up working for a company and then having stock, uh, owning stock in it, and then the company goes bankrupt and you lose pretty much everything. So now there's heavier regulations about contributing to uh, a 401k plan in company stock because of those situations. Uh, but be careful. Uh, there, 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 there could be, you know, too much risk in putting your own capital in a company that you also work for. And then don't chase hot, hot performance. And I always, I was get concerned if I talked to somebody about how they select their 401k investments and they, they say, well, I looked at the statement last year and I, I picked the top three uh, performing funds. Well, one, they're probably all invested in the same thing. So you're not really diversified. And then two, oftentimes they do poorly the very next year because they become out of favor. So um, make sure that you're, uh, investing in some of those things that didn't do well last year, like international and emerging markets, because they do have the potential to, to have a good year. And you want to be in them when they have a good year, not the year later. Investment approaches that work uh, start early. That is a key, key recommendation. So even if you have a uh, teenage children that, you know, maybe had a summer job, um, you know, maybe they can set up a, a Roth, you know, that early, they just need earned income and they could start investing early. Um, invest regularly and automatically. It's sort of, uh, if it doesn't hit your check, it doesn't hit your checking account. Um, it's a good thing. <laughs> so if you can uh, make sure you're, putting as much as you can in your 401k, the minimum to get the match, ideally in, in increase it over time until you get to the max. And then once you get to the max, then you start investing on your own. So maybe, uh, you know, some employers will allow you to um, send part of your paycheck to your checking account and part of your paycheck to a savings account or even a brokerage account. And so that way you get into the habit of not having that money in your checking and then you're tempted to spend it. Dollar cost averaging, that's a concept that um, you just put in the same dollar amount regularly, say every two weeks, the market goes up and down. And when the market's up, you're buying less shares at a more expensive price. And then when the market goes down, you're actually buying more shares at a cheaper price. So on average, you have a lower cost. Um, direct deposit from paycheck I already talked about. And then staying in the market. Um, it's it's uh, just as important to be in the market when the market's up. Um, it's more important to be in the market when the market's up than out of the market when the market's down. It's, you just can't time the market. It is too difficult. Markets on a day-to-day -day basis is driven by sentiment. But over a long period of time, markets are driven by corporate profits. And corporate profits go in cycles, good cycles and bad cycles, but they do always come back. So if you invest long-term, 
you'll know that you can make money over time. So time value of money, um, this looks at, you know, how money compounds over time. So if you have an initial investment of 10,000 and it earns 7% per year, it will almost double in 10 years. So that's also a rule of 72. So um, if you have, uh, a, you know, a 7% return or 7.2% return, you can expect your money to double every 10 years. So this is really important uh, in terms of starting early and uh, staying in the market. In terms of managing your investments, uh, pay attention to investment expenses. Uh, so a key, um, key statistic to look at is uh, expense ratio. So making sure that you're looking at the expense ratio relative to investments of its same peer or asset class. So you'll want to look at if it's a large cap U.S. fund that you're looking at a peer group of large cap U.S. funds. If you're looking at an emerging market fund, you want to be making sure you're comparing it to other emerging market funds. Those tend to be more expensive because you're you're trading on foreign exchanges. At least the manager is tra trading on foreign exchanges, and it's a little bit more expensive to transact in, in less liquid markets. The same with small cap, so there'll be a little bit higher expenses. So just be aware that when you compare an expense ratio that you're comparing it to with uh, with other apples to apples comparison. Beware of taxes, but don't let them dictate your investment strategy. That's um, don't let the, the 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 tail wag the economic dog, the tax tail wag the economic dog. So uh, even though a strategy might have higher turnover, uh, meaning that it sells stocks before a year and you're subject to short-term capital gains, it shouldn't um, make you ignore that investment completely. Uh, it's just part of that review process. Monitor your investment strategy, make sure you stay on target, and then rebalance your portfolio over time, especially during part periods of, of volatility. So you want to make sure that you've, if you've picked 65% that you want in equities, that you stay generally within that range, assuming that's appropriate for your risk profile and time horizon. And then um, investments and financial planning is an iterative process. So you want to make sure that you continue to evolve uh, and make changes along the way. So your investment goals might change. Um, what I see in working with clients is they might have a health issue that prompts them to retire earlier. So we need to make a change on their investment profile. Uh, maybe we become a little bit less uh, aggressive and we add more bonds to the portfolio. Um, and another situation um, might, might be that you're working longer. And um, so you expect to work another five years so that you can be a little bit more aggressive because you know you're not going to tap into that money uh, soon. And then your attitudes might change toward risk and return. Um, coming out of the Great Recession in 08, people definitely changed their perspective about uh, returns. And even going through March of 2000, when the market was down very dramatically in a very quick amount of time. Um, you know, people said, how did I feel? Some people say, well, I just didn't open my statement. <laughs> or other people said, uh, I couldn't do it. And I, I, I sold a part of it. And, um, you know, think about that. It's not an all or nothing thing. So if you are nervous about the market and want to sell a little bit, it's better than selling everything. And then as your financial situation changes, a, a job loss or an inheritance, um, that could change your situation dramatically. Um, and then 
uh, as you become more experienced, you, you can look at other asset classes that might help diversify the portfolio as you become more comfortable with investing. And just some uh, final uh, thoughts, uh, looking forward, remember investing is a, a voyage of discovery. So uh, don't think that uh, you can't come back from mistakes. Um, don't dwell on mistakes, just move forward. There's always, hindsight's always 2020 when you look back on an investment and it doesn't turn out as, as profitable as you would have thought when you first invested in it. But make changes as you as you as you move forward and learn from that. Um, learning is essential. This is the most important part of, of investing. You learn about yourself. You learn about investments and uh, and what you can um, stomach in terms of volatility. So to summarize, um, professional can help make investment decisions uh, with you. They can incorporate investment preferences if you're interested in ESG, which is environmental government and uh, environmental, social and, and governance. Uh, you want investments that are socially responsible. Um, you can look at investments that can do that. Um, your situation is, is unique. Uh, I, I think that you know, talking in cocktail parties, people will always tell you about the stock that they invested in that did well. They'll never tell you about the stock that didn't do well. And keep that in mind. And then you're ultimately responsible for your investment results. So even if you work with a financial professional, make sure that you're meeting with them on a regular basis. Make sure that if you don't understand uh, the investment that they're recommending, that they sit down and explain it to you. Uh, at your pace, um, that's what they're paid to do. So make sure that you get um, get at least that from your investment professional. And then lastly, I have some uh, recommended reading. And um, John Bogle, obviously the, the founder of Vanguard, um, has a couple of books uh, that he writes that are very good. And then Christine Benz, she's part of Morningstar. Um, so if you're interested in, in researching mutual funds, that's a good place to go. And then getting help, uh, we uh, FPA has a, a search function on their website. So you can search um, in your area for a financial planner. Uh, and then we also included um, disclosure checks. That's very important uh, at the bottom of the page to uh, once you decide on a financial planner uh, or even before you meet with them that you check um, their status on FINRA. So we're all regulated um, by the SEC or by FINRA and it will include any disclosures, any complaints and things like that um, on, on our profile. So it's very important to make sure you're checking uh, with that. And with that, I'll, I'll take any questions. Had to unmute myself. <laughs> That's the, the thing we're all used to doing now. So um, hi, I'm Madeline. Hi. I also work in the Office of Civics and Community Services here at LAPL. Thanks so much, Amy. That was super informative. And I have a few questions for you. Um, so do you have any recommendations on how I can select a brokerage firm? Like are there ratings or reviews? Um, is there another way to invest or do I have to use a brokerage firm? Um, you have to use a brokerage firm. If you want to buy stocks, um, if you want to buy individual stocks, you have to use a brokerage firm. So there's two ways you can go. There is the discount brokerage firms, which is like Schwab and Fidelity, TD, Vanguard. Um, so sort of those names. So that's where you go direct. So you would um, call them up or open an account online. Um, they're all covered under what's called SIPC insurance. So, so the, the, investments um, that you buy are insured in case the brokerage firm goes 
uh, bankrupt. So okay. those continue to be your, your securities that you hold. Um, and then there's another route, which is what we call uh, full service brokerage firms. So that's going to be more like your Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley. So that's where you have one person to talk to uh, or a team that you talk to. Um, and it's more full service. Obviously, they're going to help you pick your stocks and bonds and that kind of thing. But if you want to buy stocks, you have to use a brokerage brokerage account. Um, the other route is to use uh, mutual funds and mutual funds. You can go directly to a mutual fund company. And that would be something like Vanguard or T. Rowe Price, um, where you select from their menu of mutual funds. Um, so that's that's pretty much how, how you would go about you, you. You definitely need a financial institution in order to, to buy these mutual funds and stocks. OK, well, thank you. And I, I did see a question pop in um, from our YouTube viewer. And the person asked about seminarios about investing. What is your opinion about seminarios in Los Angeles? Is that a thing, seminarios? I'm not familiar with that. I'd have to Google it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe that Does Jamie know. <laughs> maybe that person could clarify what a seminar. Oh, se oh seminars. I think seminars. Oh, okay. What is your opinion about seminars about? Oh, investing? Um, yeah. There. Uh, I think that's obviously you understand why they're there. They're they're there to get new clients. So. Uh, okay. I, well, oops. You just have to keep you just have to keep that in mind. Not not like it's a timeshare, but sometimes you know if they're not going to make you join, but you you could probably go and get a good uh, education uh, and find out. Uh, but I'm sure that there's no obligation to to move forward. Um, but the more you can learn, um, even about these, the better. And you know, it's just if you if you're an audio learner, I, I would go to seminars. If you're more if you're if you read and you learn better that way, then read books. Great, thank you. Thanks, audience, for clarifying. I'm sorry I missed the seminars. It just Oof, right over my head. Yeah, and I have my colleagues said, be careful because they're trying to sell you a product or service. So just keep in mind that that's the whole point of doing the seminar is to get new clients or sell a product. So you just have to keep that in mind. Okay, great. And then, um, and that's really important to keep in mind. So someone else asked, uh, what was the website you had suggested? So I feel oh, like it's, it's yeah, morning, maybe we could type it in the chat, but it's morningstar.com. Okay. So let's see if they can type that into, thank you. And then someone asked, are some, are some of them? Oh, that's beautiful. I love it's on the screen. Thanks, Jamie. Um, someone asked if, uh, if some of them are fake. So I don't mean maybe the websites are fake or the workshops that, so I'm not sure what's fake. Maybe they can clarify what they're asking. Um, maybe some of the seminars that's, you know, just you have to be aware of, of where the people are from and, you know, make sure that it's a legitimate business in terms of, you know, if some are fake. Mm -hmm. And that's why, that's why big financial institutions advertise. So, um, you're going to know a Schwab or Fidelity because they advertise everywhere in Vanguard. Um, so you know that they're legitimate. Um, but there's other ones that are small, really unknown. And if that's the case, then you can go to that brokercheck.finra.org. You can search under institution as well as individual. So okay. that's a good place to go. And, and even institutions will have disclosures. So um, it's always good to go to that website and maybe we can pop that up on the screen, the brokercheck.finra.org. Um, and uh, yeah, and so that's, that's important to check. So I think that, yes, in general, um, someone had asked that, you know, are some websites fraud? And I think um, yesterday night session was uh, 
really specific about fraud. They had some more information there um, from the SEC. So that might be helpful for you to be able to, if you missed it last night, um, to watch, it's on our YouTube channel. Um, you can review that. And then, I, I mean, Amy, do you have any, are there any websites that have come up as being very based in fraud, like caught for fraud and, and doing something? Well, I would say, you know, the biggest one that we know of is, well, that everyone kind of knows of is, is Madoff. And I think that, I think the, the red flag with Madoff is that the custodian and the investment manager were the same entity. So uh, for many financial planners like myself, uh, we have a registered investment advisor that we work with. That's, that's the investment management arm. And then we have a custodian that holds our client's assets. So we have ability to trade in that account, view it. We mm -hmm. don't have the ability to take money out and distribute mm -hmm. it to third parties. Mm -hmm. So that's where that division happens. And I, and what, what happened with Madoff is that he was the one creating the account statements for people mm -hmm. because he's the one who owned the custodian. So he was, he was both. So he was, he was issuing fake statements to clients because he was the custodian. So unfortunately that went unchecked a long time and many people lost their money. But I think one thing to ask is, who holds my assets? Mm -hmm. Is it you or is it an independent third third party that mm -hmm. you know that okay. verifies that money's there? And then can you um, I know we're almost at time, but um, in reviewing some of the information that you put out there, were there any um, like what do you think about investments like gold, silver, or cryptocurrency? Mm -hmm. like those those come up a lot. They do. Um, uh, in terms of my firm and crypto, um, definitely the technology is, is going to be here and stay. Uh, it's just so much in its infancy to be able to um, recommend our clients to invest in it. Um, a, a definite, well, I guess one of the criteria for a currency is to be a stable source of value. And right now, crypto is not a stable source. It, it moves around constantly. Mm -hmm. In terms of, of gold and precious metals, um, they're, they're not an investment per se. They're more of a um, uh, sort of a, a black swan protection. Um, and so if, if people are gonna allocate to that, um, we would recommend it be a pretty small part of the portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you, you, if you want commodities exposure, which is inflation exposure, um, you know, you can look at a broad basket of, of, of commodities like, like metals that are in industrial metals like copper um, and then agriculture, uh, energy, oil. So we would we would invest it more in a diversified manner versus, versus saying just put three percent in gold. Um, but it, you know, our generally it, we don't recommend gold in in, in portfolios to a, a, you know it would be a very very small portfolio. You really want uh, things that are income generating, like a stock that pays dividends, um, okay. that kind of thing. So yeah, not something we deal with a lot. Okay, but thank you for sharing that. And then um, we had a couple of questions like, you know, any recommended documentary for learning more about investing, which kind of ties into the question I had with which, you know, do you have any advice for people just getting started? Um, someone asked about like a school to learn about investing and also brought up the very important uh, question is like, why don't high schools teach about investing, you know, so financial literacy really um, isn't something that's covered as a subject in schools that I've been familiar with. People, you know, I would meet people who studied it um, later in life, but you know, as part of an academic program. But I do wish also, you know, that there was um, more formalized education about it, so people, anybody, you know, in public school could learn about it. But Amy, like, what do you think about um, getting started, 
you know, is there any on, are there any schools or not like, I guess a school that you have to, a school that where you can just go and learn about this topic or um, I see that Jamie has let that, let us know that books are really the place, lots of podcasts, community colleges. So those are like good answers to start with. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely a community college um, that I've, seen um investing classes like an extension program like ucla mm -hmm. extension um, okay. those are great places to start yeah those are definitely great places to start um, okay mm -hmm. and then on our landing page so www.lapl.org um, backslash financial hyphen planning um there are book lists there and so the book lists do uh can take, thank you. <laughs> um, the book lists have lists of what, um, you know, our recommended reads from our business department. Um, and so I think that those are also helpful in addition to the resources that you've recommended, looking at extensions, extension schools from universities and then community colleges for sure. So, um, and yeah, you know, a, a financial literacy is super important and um, hopefully we'll see more of it um, as we, as we, go ahead and people have more and more questions about money. Um, so I think that about wraps it up with our limit of time. Um, we are at an hour, a little over actually. So um, thank you so much again, Amy. Thank you. Knowledgeable, we really appreciate your time. Um, I just wanna have a, uh, have a reminder to share that Saturday, October 16th is Pro Bono Financial Planning Day. So don't miss the opportunity to have a free private telephone consultation with a certified financial planner professional where you can discuss your personal finance questions, concerns, and interests from the comfort of your home. You can make your appointment at www.lapl.org financial hyphen planning. Um, this concludes our presentation tonight and don't miss tomorrow's program on Thursday, October 14th at 6 p.m. Also from the Financial Planning Association, Retirement Planning and Independence. So thanks so much and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.